Hi everyone, Stepan here. It's Thursday, so welcome to another Thursday Endgame video. Uh, today I'm going to go over a very complicated endgame uh, which people underestimate, underestimate the difficulty of drawing it, and that's Rook and Knight versus Rook. As opposed to Rook and Bishop versus Rook, which is a much harder endgame to draw and has a 30% win rate uh, for the attacker, this uh, endgame has a much lower win rate, almost insignificant, but I think your technique has to be impeccable to draw it, and most importantly, you have to be concentrated throughout the game, you have to be concentrated during every turn, otherwise you could lose. Why? Because one blunder could, could cost you the game, even more so than when playing against Rook and Bishop. We're going to look at three games uh, in which very strong players have lost these endgames. The first game you can see uh, on, the, on the right side of the screen is Polgar Kasparov from 1996. Uh, this is the most famous one, and everybody cites this game. I saw it in Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual for the first time, uh, where he gives it as an example of how, even though uh, Rook and Knight versus Rook should be a draw, uh, precise defense is needed. Now, I've used my own analysis, uh, and I think I found improvements for Judith Polgar, uh, as, as we are going to see. However, uh, in the starting position, uh, Already, it seems that white is in a bit of trouble. This is now move 62, uh, and Judith Polgar played uh, king to h4. I'm going to go through the insignificant moves where she was defending prof properly fairly quickly so that we could focus on the important points in the game. So rook g1 played by Gary Kasparov, rook g5. Of course, uh, needless to say, if the rooks are traded off, then, then a draw. Uh, checking on h1 would be not such a good idea because the king could get away from the back rank. Uh, yeah, one thing I should mention before we start going through the games, the only way to checkmate is if the king is cornered uh, and if the king is forced to the back rank. Uh, the mating nets are going to be extremely sophisticated as we are going to see. Playing with bishop and rook against rook gives you two options. Option A, checkmate. Option B, win the bishop. Playing, uh, playing against knight and rook uh, is, is much harder. Okay, so... Okay, uh, in this position, uh, king to, rook to f1 was played. Of course, declining the trade. Rook to a5. And now what Judith Polgar is doing, she is slowly but surely getting into a position where she can check Kasparov's king from the side or from behind. Uh, king f6 played, uh, and this is a good move, of course. Kasparov knows that the only way to checkmate is by using the king as well. The knight and rook alone cannot deliver mate. And here uh, a mistake was played, uh, which doesn't make too much sense. Rook to a8 was played. It's not that it's a losing blunder, but it's a bad move. What she should have played is after king f6, king to g4. And now there is no way for black to make progress. This would have been a very simple draw. I think they would have agreed to a draw in a couple of moves. So for example, rook f4 check, king h3, rook f2, cutting the king off, king g4. And you can just repeat basically because the black king can never join into the attack because the rook is cutting it off along the fifth rank. And because if the knight moves, the rook is going to be under pressure or the king is going to get away. This would have been a simple draw. However, rook a8, rook a8 is imprecise. Again, it's it's a drawn endgame, but rook a8 gives black more options. Why? Because black now plays rook g1, and now your king is never getting away from the back rank. Okay, let's go through the moves quickly. Rook f8, check, king e5, rook e8, check, king f4, rook f8, check, king e4. This is the drawing technique. You want to either uh, check the king from behind or from the sides or force the knight to block the checks because if the knight and king are one unit which is pinned by the rook then uh, the attacker's rook alone cannot do anything king f3 played progress made king h5 knight g3 check and now king h6 uh, the king is slowly getting away from the black king and from the black forces knight f5 king h7 king f4 rook b8 uh, everything fine so far. The point behind rook b8 is that you are perhaps trying to check uh, from the side. Rook g7 check and king h8. And now this is where you should start getting worried with white. Again, this position is a draw as I'm going to try and demonstrate. However, when your king is in the corner, there are mating nets. And this is what the attacker should try to achieve. Not because it's winning, but because you are playing a human 
and a human can make a mistake. So in this position, rook d7 was played, uh, simply giving himself a bit more options, a bit more room. A rook e8 played, uh, stopping the king from advancing to the e-file. Uh, of course, the, the white king doesn't have much point in going to g8, it's basically the same thing. King g5, now the king makes progress along the g-file. Rook e6, stopping the king from advancing, again a very good move. Knight d4 attacking the rook, rook e1, preparing to check from behind. King f6, trying to create a mating net, trying to cover the king with the knight if the, if the need arises. Rook to d1, now of course knight f5 would be met with uh, rook d7. Rook d5, uh, and in this position, yeah, believe it or not, uh, a losing blunder was played. So the idea behind this uh, move, rook to d5, is to be able to play rook h5 and knight e6 or knight f5. Because when the knight gets into this attacking position uh, on e6, cutting a king away from these two squares, then you can see that the white king is cornered. And for example, if uh, black could move twice, then a simple checkmate could be delivered, knight e6 and rook h5, and there would be no way for for the for the white king to do okay, it's not mate immediately because of rook g because of king g8, but mate would follow quickly. Uh like this. Okay. Okay, in this position, what Judith Polgar should have played was rook to f1. And after rook f1, it's a draw, there is no way for, for black to make progress, you are chasing the king away. Uh, knight f5, even though it seems very tricky, covering the king, you still have a draw with rook to f2, you can just wait, because the knight cannot move. For example, rook to d1, trying to check from behind, king to g8, again, no issues here. If the king, and, and again, excuse my uh, mistakes in the analysis, this is my analysis, uh, so there are going to be a ton of mistakes. Uh, I have only engine checked the key points uh, because I tried to understand all three games. Okay, so after king g8 there is no easy way to make progress because the king and knight are forced to be one unit. They cannot split. If they do split by the king moving to g6 or f6, then you check. If the knight moves, well then that's illegal. Instead of that, uh, Judith Polgar played uh, rook to a1. And now, for those of you interested in puzzles, this is a forced mate in 16 moves. Uh, I didn't manage to solve it. Of course, I mean, it's. I, I, I think many grandmasters would have trouble solving it. Uh, Gary Kasparov did not play the, the most forcing and best line, but still, he, he did win the game. Okay, and now uh, knight to e6 was played. And in this position, whatever white does, it's checkmate time, because there are too many threats. Okay, in this position, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever you do, you are in trouble. Uh, you did Polgar played rook to a6. Uh, let's just look at some other options. Rook a6 is the best defensive idea, again, trying to uh, prevent the, the king and knight from splitting. For example, if uh, king to h7 is played, then this is a fairly simple checkmate. Uh, and this is actually, if you had this position after after king to h7, I, I bet you could solve it yourself. So the sequence is knight g5, king h6. We are going to look at king h8 briefly. Oh, okay, if king h8, just rook d8 checkmate. We don't have to look at that. Uh, knight f7 check, the king is forced to go to h7, rook h5, king g8, and now rook h8 checkmate. And if instead of king h7, uh, she had played king to g8, trying to run away, then rook d8 check, king h7, knight g5 check, king h6, and rook h8. Again, a very simple checkmate. Therefore, rook a6 is a resilient move. Uh, in this position, uh, I think a very good move was played. Uh, I think this is the only move, king to f7. Uh, if uh, rook to d8 is played, then king to h7, and I don't think the same variations work, or they don't work because you don't have a check here, so it's not that easy to follow through. But king f7 now gets the king into g6, and that's the key maneuver. So rook a7 played, king g6. Of course, you couldn't play king g6 immediately because of rook takes knight. And in this position, uh, everything is winning. Uh, she tried rook to a8, but now uh, Gary Kasparov won convincingly. There was an improvement to his play. Uh, the most accurate move was rook to d6. 
defending the sixth rank and now there is nothing to be done uh, if white just waits for example with rook to b8 then knight g5 there are no checks along the sixth rank for example rook g8 check king g6 and if waiting because there's nothing else to do then knight h7 uh, rook to b8 knight to f6 rook to f8 king to g6 rook to b8 and rook to d1 and mate is unstoppable or you can give up the rook i mean if if you want to but then you get mated anyway uh, rook g8 knight g8 king g8 rook d8 mate uh, and after knight d6 if the most resilient move was played uh, king to g8 then again a very quick victory with the move knight to g5 again cutting the king off king to f8 trying to escape but now rook e6 preventing the escape king g8 going back knight h7 i'm going for the same thing rook c8 rook e7 rook c6 check knight f6 check and now you have to you have to give up the rook and, and lose on the next move but after king h8 rook h7 is mate instead of rook d6 though uh, which is a very powerful idea and you uh, if you have this position while attacking you should remember that when the king is in the corner you want to defend your knight and king along the sixth rank because then the defender will not be able to dislodge them instead of that kasparov played rook d7 which is a good move winning anyway but not as quickly uh, rook to b8 played she just decided to wait now rook c7 waiting uh, perhaps he didn't know what to do but i i have a feeling that he wanted to get his rook to c5 instead of uh, d5 for some reason so king g8 rook c5 the king is not going anywhere of course uh, rook a8 again waiting rook to b5 waiting rook to h8 rook to b7 he didn't have a clear idea of what to do but he managed to get there in the end rook c8 both sides wait and now knight c7 this is a very powerful move uh because the knight is going to be transferred to e8 uh this is an astonishingly strong idea okay so rook g8 was played of course king h6 and now rook g1 but now there is no salvation anymore uh rook to b8 check rook to g8 and knight to e8 and here uh judith polgar resigned uh, let's just see what could happen uh, you basically only have one move if you don't want to get mated if you move your rook away from uh, the a rank then i win with knight f6 and the quick mate on h7 so for example if you do this i go knight f6 and you uh, you get mated in one next move if you cover i take and there's nothing else to do so after knight e8 let's say she played the only move uh, rook to f8 Okay, after rook to f8, you simply play king to g6, and after rook to g8, you play king to f7. And now again, there is no more defense. Uh, next move, knight f6. So for example, king gauge 7 knight f6, you win the rook. Uh, if the rook moves, then knight f6 is checkmate. So an astonishing game, uh, which again is is has been quoted uh, on, on a ton of occasions. At least that's what I found in my research. But such a thin line between uh, drawing and losing these endgames. So obviously rook a1 is, is the losing move. We don't have to discuss that anymore. The reason for that is that the knight has a free jump into e6. Uh, and, and the black king can then make progress. Yeah, uh, so it's incredible that after rook f1 check, which you could have played instead, the position is still just a draw. Okay, uh, let's look at the other game. Uh, the second game is Alexander Onischuk versus Linier Dominguez, uh, played in Beal 2008. This is uh, the point at which Black captured the pawn. Again, we are going to stroll through the moves quickly. So, White is playing incredibly well, uh, keeping the king in the center, not getting forced to the to uh, to a back rank. Okay, white has a great game, keeping the king in the center, making the knight immobile with the pin. This is the recipe for, for a draw. Eventually, though, black is going to be able to make progress. It's not possible to, to keep your king in the center if black plays properly. King f5, rook f8, knight f7. Now black is making progress. You have to be smart, but if you are, and if you think about your moves, you can, you can nudge your king slowly towards the defender. So let's go through the moves quickly. Eventually, the king is forced back one more file. Okay, then he's forced back another file. 
Now again, this maneuver covering the checks with the knight. This is a very nice W maneuver. This is famous in the bishop and knight checkmate, but it's also uh, a pattern that can be used here, just cutting the checks off with your knight in a W shape, so you could see what what the what the knight did. Okay, king to b2, uh, king to d3, slowly, slowly getting towards the king. Okay, and in this position, rook check, king d4, king to c2. White is constantly switching his rook to a side of the board from which he can check uh, with a great distance, and that's a smart technique, and this is still a draw. So rook c7, check, and now covering with the knight. But white, as we said, had a, has a very good position because uh, as soon as the king and knight are made into one unit, then there is no way to make progress. So black waits. King b2. Uh, now he transfers to the other side of the board, uh, planning to play the move king, uh, planning to play the move rook to g2. King b3, rook g2. Now this is getting a bit tricky. Now, as you can see, the white king only has three squares, well, four, and he is getting uh, nudged towards the, the rim. King b4, rook b2 check. Now, again, uh, you have to go to the back rank. And now, first mission accomplished. Now, from this position on, again, no way to win for black if black is playing an engine, but if you're playing a human, well, okay. So, uh, a bit of waiting, no real prog progress by black, a bit of waiting, a bit of waiting. And here, uh, in this position, rook to c7 check was played. And after king d3, now, this is my understanding of this endgame. So white has to either stay on the C file to prevent the king from coming in uh, to somewhere, C2 or, or C3, or he has to switch to the side again to be able to check from the side to either force the knight to block or to force the king away. Those are the two, two things he has to do. One of these two he has to do. So for example, in this position, if white had played rook to c8, show me a way for black to make progress. There is no way to make progress. You can try blocking with the knight again, but there, there is no long-term way to, to win this position like that. Okay. Uh, the other technique, which I think is even better, is just rook h7. And after king c2, rook h2, king c3, rook h3, king c4, rook h4. Again, you are blocking and you are pinning the knight to the king. The knight is going to have to move or the king is going to have to move. No way to make progress. In the game, though, black blundered horrendously. Black played the move rook to d7. Pinning the knight to the king when the black king can make progress. And this is now just a lost position. Okay, so uh, white plays king to c2. Okay, now he is threatening mate. Mate is threatened in one move, so king to a3. If you try rook a7 to block the mate, then rook to b2 check. King to a3, knight to b5 check wins the rook. So these endgames cannot be won unless you spot the tactics. If you want to win, A, your opponent has to make a mistake, B, you have to be tactically really good. So king a3 played, which doesn't lose the rook, but, but loses the game. Knight c6, no checks. You can see that if the rook was on h7, g7, f7, even e7, then a check would be possible and the game could be saved. King a4 played in this position. Again, a mate was threatened. Uh, rook b4 check, king to a3, and now rook to b5, and there is nothing white could do now. Mate in one threatened, and if you try to go king a4, then I just mate you uh, on a5. An incredible finish. I mean, this was just astonishing. This maneuver, like after, after rook d7, black played perfectly. Look at this pattern. Uh, king c2, king a3, knight c6, no checks, King a4, only move, rook b4, king a3, only move, and rook b5. And it must be horrible to lose this endgame, but I mean, Onishchuk lost, which is, I mean, he's, or sorry, Linear Dominguez won this, he played this uh, great combination at the end. Okay, and the last game, uh, oh, sorry, I went a bit too far. Uh, the last game is Jose Antonio Guillén Ramírez versus Miguel Ilescas Cordova from 2008. This was played in Linares, although I'm not sure it was the same format of tournament as the Linares from the 90s. Now, uh, King H8 played, of course, only move. And I chose this position because it seems lost, but it's not. 
it's equal even though white is in the corner because black cannot set up a winning idea it's just very hard with the white rook uh, able to check and force the king away and and do whatever it wants most importantly though cutting the king away uh, to form mating net rook d7 black waits rook b6 rook c7 rook a6 white just waits rook b7 rook a5 perhaps not the smartest idea but okay still still okay rook a6 check king f7 King h7, he used this opportunity to, to get away from the corner, which is okay. Slightly risky, I would rather keep the king uh, away from the 6th rank, but this is also okay. Rook c7, rook b6, white again waits, rook a7, uh, rook b8. Risky, again, but okay, works. King f6, check. King to h8. Rook a1 played by black. Uh, and here I would like to stop uh, and think about... A move that loses the game. O only one move basically loses if you don't just give up material with rook b1. I'll show you a good move uh, and uh, I'll show you how white could have drawn this, this position. This is a pattern you have to remember. Uh, king g8. Simply getting away from the corner uh, and making room for your king. Your king has to have space to breathe. If your king doesn't have space, regardless of whose pieces are blocking it, then the chance for it to get mated are much higher. Okay, uh, after king to g8, there would be no way, way, to, way to make progress. This is just some of my analysis. For example, uh, knight to g7, trying to, well, cover on e6 when the rook checks. So rook to b6, knight to e6. Again, I mean, you don't have enough to mate. It's not enough because the knight and king are not working. They are basically safeguarding each other instead of attacking the king. Instead of that, and I hope you found this move as an instructive blunder, uh, white played the move rook f8 check. And after this, the game is simply over. It's, it's over. Uh, of course, black played king to g6. And now, if you check me again, for example, rook g8 check, which wasn't played in the game, I go king f7. I don't go king h6, I go king f7. And now I'm threatening mate. So, so what do you do? How can you how can you defend here? Let's say rook to f8, and I take it, for example. Uh, let's say king to h7, and I mate you. Uh, let's say rook to g7, and I take it because it's not stalemate. So yeah, rook g8 wouldn't work. After king g6, for example, if you try king to g8, then a beautiful checkmate knight e7, king h8, rook h1, like from a puzzle book. And after king g6, if you just wait, claiming that black doesn't have a checkmate, then let's say rook b8 or rook c8 or whatever, knight f7, oh, I'm sorry, king to f7, and now you you will be able to block with the knight and then deliver mate on the h file. So rook to b7 check, only move to stop mate, knight e7, and now the only move to stop mate is rook takes knight. Uh, if you go king h7 or wait with the rook, then rook h1 checkmate. Instead of those three options which lose, uh, white chose an option which loses anyway, he played rook to e8. And now after one move by black, white resigned, king to f7 and and that's it. I mean, that's it's just game over. I think these are extremely instructive positions. This is the same uh, as uh, what we saw after, after rook g8 check, king f7. Uh, Rook f8 was the only try. So I, I think these three examples are very instructive. Again, if you want to learn this endgame, I would advise you to call a friend and ask him, do you want to practice this with me? My uh, The downside of this endgame for me is that there are no rules I could give you. There are no rules I could write down for myself. Uh, what I like when recording videos and when studying is structure. So I like to know, okay, this is an endgame which is drawn like this, it's won like this. For this one, there is simply nothing I could tell you. What I can tell you is that you get mated when you are stuck in a corner and when the knight and king are free to create a mating net. Okay, so the most ideal setup is with your king on, in this case, f7, or let's say f2, c2, or c7, the king on h1, h8, a1, a8, and the rook being able to check on the same file where the king is. So that's that's a common setup. Now again, remember the drawing technique, technique to either check the king from the side or from behind, or to uh, pin the knight to the king to render them useless. 
to make them unable to make progress. I hope this helps. Again, I'm sure it won't help enough unless you practice it. So try to play this against Stockfish 7, try to defend and try to defend until you succeed. Success is of course the 50 move rule. Hope this helps. Thank you very much guys. Again, a reminder, uh, stream starts at 2 p.m. Croatian. See you then. Bye.